Well, thank you very much, Sin. Um, well, thank you to those of you who have joined us today for the conference that marks the launch of an exhibition which is very dear to the hearts of everyone at Art Science Museum, Floating Utopias. Ever since the first moon ascended into the skies in the 18th century, inflatable objects have inspired the public's imagination, generating utopian dreams of castles in the sky, floating laboratories and cloud cities. Floating Utopia explores the social history of inflatable objects, showing how they've been used in art, architecture, and activism over the decades. This is the first major exhibition of inflatable objects in Southeast Asia, and I'm thrilled that we've been able to realize the show here in Singapore. In today's conversations event, you'll be meeting some of the brilliant artists and curators who have made this show possible. Three of the co-curators of the exhibition will be speaking, as will several of the artists uh, who have work in the show. Today's conference will begin with a talk by the three co-curators of Floating Utopias, Atta, Fabiola, and Anna. Their Floating Utopias Foundation have worked with my team here at Art Science Museum, plus the original host venue of the exhibition, the NGB, to create an that includes over 40 artworks by international and local artists. They include Ant Farm, Event Structure Research Group, Luke Jerem, Thomas Saraceno, Frank Masicelli, Ahmed Ogut, and the Yes Men. And we're all delighted uh, that three of the artists who have work in the exhibition are going to speak to us today. Uh, one of the true pioneers of inflatable art is Graham Stevens. Later, Singaporean artist Dawn will join us, and Arta will speak um, later on, uh, returning to the stage to reflect on the practice of his collective Tools for Action. In many ways, Floating Utopias is an exhibition that could really only happen here at Art Science Museum in Singapore. As with many of our shows, it combines education and playfulness with technological innovation and artistic ingenuity. But this show is also grounded by a strong political narrative that reveals how inflatable objects have been used for ideological purposes and grassroots activism. As a spectacle, Floating Utopias is a series of encounters with breathtaking floating artworks which dramatically occupy Art Science Museum's striking curved galleries. Sculptures are suspended in the air, compressed into uncomfortable spaces, sloped at unusual angles, and set adrift within the museum. The artworks variously inspire, disrupt, and embolden visitors to explore history of inflatable objects and their social functions, and how they change the way that we look at the world. One of the most important components of this exhibition is a series of outdoor performances and hands-on workshops, which really invite the public to take part and shape their own utopia. The first of these performances is Signals 2.0, which takes place tonight outside on the Marina Bay waterfront. It's devised by Tools for Action, who are inviting the public to participate in a unique nocturnal performance that encourages new forms of assembly and communication using 22 large portable light sculptures. This new version of the performance is choreographed by Tools for Action, working with Singapore-based performer Susan Sentler from La Salle College of the Arts. And Arta will speak a little bit more about that later. We're also encouraging participation and hands-on interaction within the exhibition itself. One of the key artworks of the exhibition is Museo Aero Salar by Thomas Saraceno, a lighter-than-air balloon sculpture powered by the heat of the sun. Saraceno and his Aero Salar Foundation have conducted workshops around the world which help communities build their own solar balloons using recycled plastic. The latest Museo Aero Salar workshop is situated right here in the galleries of Art Science Museum in Floating Throughout the course of the exhibition, visitors will be encouraged to bring used plastic bags to Art Science Museum and work together inside the galleries to create a giant, colourful, recycled plastic patchwork balloon, which will be launched into the sky towards the end of the show. 
Museo Era Salah shows how collective creation can emerge from individual acts. It's one of the many artworks in the show that uses inflatable objects to advocate for a more sustainable relationship between people and our environment. One of the first artists who addressed these topics in his work was Graham Stevens, who will be speaking later on about his pioneering work with inflatables in the 1960s and 70s. It was also very important to us when we were curating this exhibition to ensure that there was a strong local and regional story within the show. The artworks by Mamoyo Turumitsu and Dawn Ng, as well as archival footage of, from National Day Parade here in Singapore, remind us that inflatables have been used widely in Asia. The second part of the conference today will look at how inflatable objects disrupt our everyday experience through their unexpected appearance in the landscape. We're very pleased to have Dawn with us speak about her iconic inflatable rabbit, Walter. And inflatables have also been a source of inspiration for performance artists. As part of the program we've organised to contextualise floating utopias, we're staging an art science late performance by Singapore-based dance performance company Prisma. Their artistic director, Norazad Adam, is joining us this afternoon to talk about their work with inflatable objects and how they've incorporated them into dance. Dreaming up daring and unique shows like Floating Utopias requires an work from a large group of collaborators. I want to thank Atta, Anna and Fabiola, plus all the artists who have work in the exhibition for your vision, passion and commitment. And I'd also like to thank my team at Art Science Museum for embracing floating utopias. Of course, I'm deeply grateful to the exhibition team for their work on the show, but I'd also like to thank our programs team for curating such an inspiring set of events and education activities that complement the exhibition. So a very special thanks to Nina, Dina, Houdin, Stacey and Zinn, um, for the tremendous work that they've done on this program. Throughout today, we hope that the floating artworks you'll be seeing and the inspiring stories about inflatable objects you'll be hearing show you that another world is possible. I hope you're ready to lift off and explore that world with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today and for coming to hear more about the curatorial practice of this exhibition. Um, so, Honor was already saying something about the first moment when people were able to lift off the ground for the very first time. On this image, we see the court of the king in France at Versailles. Uh, where he ordered one of the first balloon experiments to take place and invited hundreds of thousands of people to come and witness this. Um, with this, the, <clears throat> the balloon became the center of attention instead of the king, and people far, far from the court could also witness this spectacle. Balloons were the very first vehicle with which we could look down on the earth from above. On this image, we see an etching by Thomas Baldwin, uh, who shows us the prospect from a balloon uh, above the clouds. Uh, you have to imagine that until uh, the first hot air balloons ascended, people had never had this view of above the clouds, something we are so used to now looking out of the window of an aeroplane. And of course, ballooning was only available for the lucky few. So this etching brought that vision of uh, looking down on Earth from above down to those on the ground as well. Um, this sort of new possibilities, the change of what was commonly possible, that humans could suddenly fly, um, meant that people started dreaming of alternative societies in the world. What we see here is a proposal for a floating city a research base and society up in the sky, away from the rules and confines of the ground. 
So what floating utopias really proposes is that floating objects have been more than just balloons. They have been able to make us think of alternative worlds, to open up new spaces, quite literally. So one of the striking characteristics, uh, as we've seen uh, making this exhibition, um, is basically that inflatables are very mobile. Their mobility, the, the, avail the availability of them to just go from one point to the next and just pack and go, you can just like wrap them up. And also these formless bundles of actually material become instantly, and you see this here in this time lapse we made through um, while installing this exhibition here, um, became instant monumental spaces, uh, spaces on location. So inflatables are soft and moldable, and they can adapt um, their shape to different spaces and situations. So this means both in a physical and in a social cultural sense. Um, so when we um, make this exhibition a year ago in Berlin, we always intended to um, let this exhibition travel. And that's why it's so exciting for us also to be here in uh, Singapore in the first stop, basically, of our hopefully tour that will continue. Um, and this is what, what we've seen here is the NGBK where we, where we started um, the show. So this light, um, mobile and soft quality of inflatables encourages also people to be, on the one hand, like dazzled spectators, and on the other hand, to be playful participants. Um, and we see, we've seen that in the Pneu show, which is by the Event Structure Research Group in the uh, late 60s. Um, this is an, a piece that we actually reenact in Berlin. I hope this is working as well. Can we? Uh, have to press it, I think. So we invited the people who were actually there during that, um, during the opening of our exhibition there to be part of this reenactment of the Pleur show. The power is also used in experimental architecture, activism, and also in the contemporary art scene. So striking examples uh, of these works are on display here in the museum, like Walter of Dan Um, Thomas Tagaseno and Momoyo Torimitsu. The unique aspect of this exhibition is that it connects contemporary practices to historical examples and also gives um, a context about the technological development. You could say also that um, it shows basically the history of the development of materials. Um, the origin of inflatable puppets, puppets, for example, can be found at the mass parades in the 1920s and 30s. Um, you, it started basically with the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York. This was a department store that uh, organized, um, oh, that organized uh, a parade one month before Christmas to kind of boost up the sales. Um, basically, what they did was uh, they had the shop windows that they decorated with, with puppets that were moving, and then they thought these kind of whimsical uh, shop windows they kind of brought out onto the streets. So the inflatable figure balloons, or the figure balloons that you can see here, they are actually puppets in, reserves, uh, in reverse. The strings don't go up like a normal puppet, but the strings go down. So this started in 1927. In 1934, Walt Disney first joined also the parade because it was immensely popular. What is really striking is that the Soviet Union also started to uh, create inflatable spectacles um, in 1933 in Leningrad, and from 1934 onwards also in Moscow on the Red Square. So it was really a battle of the spectacles. Um, on the one hand, a capitalist spectacle, um, it was entertainment, um, uh, but like entertainment, but with the idea to somehow um, induce consumerism. And then at the other hand, you had the state parades of the Soviet Union that had to educate the new values of the Soviet state. 
this was the origin. It's very interesting that um, uh, these kind of parades now are everywhere, such as, for example, the National Day Parade here in Singapore. And um, um, yeah, it's interesting to see parallels, differences. Um. So in the 1960s, we've, we've gone through different moments in time now. We see that in the 18th century, where balloons just started to appear, uh, there was a true balloon fever. Uh, in the 1930s, when these parades became widely popular, there was a rise of this interest in pneumatics again. And in the 60s and 70s, we see that uh, there's this a new pneu fever, or pneu virus, as many people call it. Um, this is because a large groups of students uh, were not quite happy with the way things were happening uh, in their time. This was a global time of political turmoil. The Vietnam War was happening. There were immense uh, student protests in the United States and Europe. And uh, young groups of arts and, uh, artists and architectures were reacting to this. One of them is the group Ant Farm we see here. Uh, they created the Inflato cookbook. Um, it is kind of a, a recipe book or a manual on how to build your own house, your own inflatable house. Uh, they really come from uh, the beginning of their environmental movement. Uh, the beginning of uh, concerns of how we deal with our planet and our environment, and thoughts of how can we uh, live in this environment in a more sustainable way. Um, the Ant Farm inspired many, many artists later on with their open source approach. So they created this manual that was available for everyone. They created recipes that were um, for anyone to use, and their environmental concerns. In the same time, in the 60s, we see a more high-end approach to pneumatics again. So in the World Expo in Osaka in Japan in 1970, uh, several architects were building immense, super impressive inflatable structures. The one you see here is today still the largest inflatable structure ever made. Uh, it's by the Fuji Group. Um, so this uh, structure is made up of tubes that are all the same length. They're all 72 meters exactly, and they're positioned in such a way closer together that the two ends go up. And you see this hippie approach of a total pneumatic experience with mandalas projected on the inside of this structure. Um, and people spinning around on turning tables within this structure. But this costs a lot of money. And you see this approach of like household material and DIY uh, sort of accessibility and this really high-end uh, technical approach within pneumatics. As, we, as Anna already mentioned before, solar sustainability or sustainability, um, looking at how we can treat the earth better is not something new that just started. It started already in the late 60s, early 70s. I'm very happy also that Graham is joining us today, who made this, who, who really had like a sort of pioneering approach in how we can really use our elemental sources, such as sun, wind, and air. And his um, desert cloud, which he was inventing, and, uh, among other uh, light, larger than air structures, uh, became like a really, uh, like an anchoring point for other inventions, how, oh, or am I a bit, um, of how we can really use um, um, the, the natural resources of the earth um, to, became, to become more sustainable. Um, in this piece, um, which hopefully Graham will explain more in detail later on, um, the sort of inflatable mattress is not only providing um, shade in a desert, but also um, extract uh, water from the air um, in a desert. Um, we jump later, Thomas Saraceno um, 
really is looking at all these key fig figures, such as Graham Stevens, among others. Um, in 2015, he, he was able to launch um, the first um, solar um, manned flight, like the longest one, in the desert of New Mexico. And um, he also founded in the same year um, the Aerosene Foundation, which is really looking at how we can become more sustainable by using these air structures, which is not, it's more like a reflection in that sense. So it's like really about the entanglement of um, the elemental sources around us, rather than really like how can we live in the air. We, we have at the one hand, we have, as Anna also mentioned, this very um, high tech approaches, and then we have also the do-it-yourself approach, and these two strands are intertwined within the exhibition. The Yes Man is more of the DIY approach. Uh, they, they, are, um, they do media activism. Oh. And, um, and here we see the survival ball. Uh, it, is a, it is kind of an inflatable suit, a harness to protect you against future disasters. And they presented this new tool at an insurance conference to basically warn against uh, climate change and all the effects. And this happened in the early 2000s. So as we mentioned before, hot air balloons were the very first moment people could be lifted off the ground. They were the very first moment that people could explore the air. And it was also the first moment they started measuring the sky as a scientific field. Uh, this also meant that the first, uh, it was the first moment they realized there was this point in the atmosphere uh, where we couldn't breathe anymore. Uh, to overcome this, they started to develop pressurized capsules in the 1930s. Uh, that were taken up by hot air balloons, by high altitude balloons, and were kind of air capsules in themselves, in which people could keep breathing and have enough oxygen. So our chapter of vertical exploration really looks into how uh, balloons were kind of a predecessor of space flight. Uh, my installation, Eyes in the Sky, explores sort of fact fiction in this early phase of uh, speculative uh, space travel, uh, because uh, these balloons and, 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 and the exploration of the sky really sparked uh, the most fantastical early sci-fi stories. And today, um, I think this is a nice example to show, uh, today inflatables are still really frequently used in space flight. Uh, so this is a moon base pr uh, proposed by the European Space Agency uh, in collaboration with many other space agencies, where uh, they proposed to build uh, a scientific village on the moon, and the habitats they would like to build there are based on inflatables. You see a nice sort of comparison with the designs from experimental architects in the 60s who were in their turn inspired by the space age of their time. So yeah, you see a clear resemblance. Um, this is a nice uh, DIY example. You want to tell a little bit about it? So it's um, more do it together than DIY. And it's really about creating community. Um, this film was actually made for COP21 in 2015 as well. Uh, and it shows really nicely like how we can use and how we can basically imagine alternative uh, spaces beyond our uh, the current world where we are at and also shows um, how um, Museo Aerosolar, which is here, has a workshop in the in the space in the in Art Science Museum, um, how you can make from a lot of plastic bags together a beautiful sculpture that lifts that that, is, um, that rises by the sun and um, this video actually goes one step further but it's nice to see uh, the collectives basically that you can create all over the world and we are super happy that Singapore will have also their own Museo Aerosolar. And, and this was really Part of our vision of the exhibition, to have a traveling exhibition that connects different communities together, literally by plastic bags, 
uh, metaphorically as well. Uh, and then also to every next location it goes, um, it also uh, looks at the history of inflatable art and technology um, on site. So it's also a growing archive um, and an ongoing artistic and curatorial project. Um, another important part is the launch in public space um, to, to really test the ability of inflatables, to see what happens. There's always something uh, uh, happening that you don't know because you have forces of wind, you have the public, and this is what actually makes it so exciting. Um, so uh, next to the Museo Aero Solar, tonight we will also see um, Signals 2.0. I will talk about this uh, later on in the presentation. Um, performance from Tools for Action in collaboration with Susan Sandler and her wonderful dance uh, students and art students. Very excited about this. And um, to finish off, we have a little video. But uh, the kind of unpredictability of inflatables is also that what uh, gives the excitement. And, um, and uh, they are poetic, they are ephemeral. Um, you could say they embody life. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, there's a slight technical hitch, so we can't show my slides. But um, so I'll just talk to this one image. Um, and it's really uh, interesting for me to be here in an art science museum. So I'm very grateful to be invited to discuss the, the idea of art as a science. <laughs> uh, because this is really uh, how I got into uh, air structures. Um, I studied uh, architecture but as part of the course we were taught environmental science including climate science. So <clears throat> I was very well aware of climate in relation to towns and uh, buildings. So as part of a student activity uh, the uh, lecturers in the university were trying to um, systematize the idea creation. Where do you get ideas from? How do you be creative? And they worked out this system where f the first thing is that they wouldn't bring lectures to, to lecture us in the, in the uh, architecture department. Instead, all the students had to go to each separate department in the university to learn each individual science or technology, engineering, chemistry, psychology of perception. And this is, makes a very big difference in, in learning the subject. And this is really the foundation of interdisciplinary uh, science that I now practice. So I, and and uh, this has enabled the uh, European Commission to appoint me as one of their experts on interdisciplinary science of art. Uh, so it's, it's very satisfying for me to get this um, contract to produce works which communicate to government because the European Union has 11 research stations uh, and they do all the science necessary to develop a modern society. But they have a real problem in communicating this science to government. And uh, the 27 member states of the European Union are simply not taking up the science as it advances. And this causes a conflict with the uh, directives of the European Union, which say that any, any government that uh, builds uh, infrastructure on a, on a big scale has to, they must, in legal terms, they're obliged to follow the best scientific 
uh, knowledge. So they, they really the contract is to translate scientific knowledge into artistic knowledge because they believe that politicians will listen be, uh, more attentively to artists than to scientists. This was news to me, but uh, it goes back to the very beginnings in the educational system of how we were taught um, <clears throat> to collect information from the environment and start manipulating it and then generate interrogation of the information, the knowledge. And the secret, if you like, of making the quantum leap into an idea is to let go and try and forget it and realize that the brain itself is what produces the idea. And you take a bath like you, um, Archimedes did, or you go for a walk. And I remember walking through Sheffield, Sheffield University, and I remember the instant of the realization of the significance of a toy balloon as expressing an expandable, contractible space that related directly to the senses of the body and would express the material sensations from tactile touching of the balloon, manipulating the balloon. And I filled it not just with air, but with also a liquid or material, solid material. So it expressed um, air and liquid uh, and material. And you get a different sensation, tactile sensation. And I, called, I called this elastic touch. This was in 1965. Uh, so <clears throat> then the next uh, step, and this is the thing with ideas, they are generating. So you, the next step is to go for the whole body, not just the hand, but the whole body. So what is the body in the environment? The body is in the atmosphere, which is made up of air. And this relates back to the, the whole scientific uh, understanding of modern science from uh, Hooke and Boyle, when uh, <clears throat> Robert Hooke was uh, elected as a curator at the Royal Society. And <clears throat> he performed all the experiments of all the uh, scientists. So he was doing something like 40 uh, experiments in public per month. And one of the things he would do was express the um, behavior and nature of air. Um, and he did some fairly gruesome experiments, like proving that humans breathe air by um, <clears throat> sticking a pipe into a, a dog's lung, uh, and pumping the dog to demonstrate how the dog was breathing. Um, but, and he, he developed the, the um, Hooke's law is from holding a balloon and measuring the extension, of the, the elasticity in the membrane, which is flexible, it's not static. So statics um, developed from these early experiments in the 17th century, 1660. Uh, and the nature of air has been at the center of development of science, uh, Western science. So that was, that was the kind of thoughts I was having with playing with a toy balloon and then making it into a, the next big structure, which I wanted to say something about architecture. So we were taught about how uh, architecture is really about controlling the senses and you make a comfort environment. So you adapt it to the, you provide the ideal environment for the body. And this, I was working with a lot of artists um, in a gallery called Signals that opened a very short time between 64 and 66 in London. It was the avant-garde gallery. And being avant-garde, they brought the avant-garde group from South America, 
um, <clears throat> people like um, uh, Oita Sika, who was involving people in the environment so that people could participate by dance in, in the environment. And there's a, a group in, in Paris called Grav Group, which is a group to research art visual. And, the, and they were <clears throat> making platforms to walk on so you would be destabilized as you walk through the environment, so you become more aware of the environment. And so I thought, well, the best way to have these experiences is to make an immersive, immersive uh, balloon that was big enough to put people inside. So people go, could go inside the artwork. So in, in technical terms, you can say uh, the static sculpture and paintings uh, always have a fixed or mobile circular route for observing and having the experience of the artwork. But if you take the canvas and take it over the, the observer, then the observer becomes a participant and it becomes part of the work. So this is the, the uh, beginnings of participation art where the, the, the body is part of, of the work. And we've built a big balloon and uh, which we had to borrow a factory and weld it all together over the weekend. And that way we learnt, you know, the, the, the real behaviour as opposed to the imaginary behaviour of uh, an air structure. And by actually making it and doing it as an experiment or a workshop or what have you. And <clears throat> The works in, in the space field, I call it, uh, space field, to give it a sense of uh, a, a space without a boundary, a field, it's just the electromagnetic field, where the, the body interacts with the environment, the 40 microvolt, um, microvolts of the, uh, the body are interacting constantly with other bodies in, in the environment. So uh, one of the works we express this interaction with the body is to have neon uh, light tubes uh, where people would walk through an electromagnetic field and it's only when they came into the field that the neon would light up. So this is, um, transmits the idea that space is full of magnetic, electromagnetic waves. And it's not empty space, which is the, the 17th century idea of space. It's, it's empty, a void. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's how um, air structures uh, began with the scientific experimentation with air, continuing on early experiments from the 17th century. So how did I get to this structure, which is uh, in the, one of the films in, in the exhibition is this desert cloud, I called it. So I, the first film is called Atmos Fields, after space fields, so that then it went from the abstract idea of space field to an atmosphere, a field in the atmosphere, so that you would be in, immersed in the atmosphere and be aware of the immersion. Um, <clears throat> So I continued the activity of walking. Walking is the main movement in the, in the environment. And I made a whole series of structures that walk in the environment. So I did walking up from the, the balloon with um, solid liquid and gas. I made the gas balloon into a, a large mattress which you bounced on. So that's walking on air. And then I filled a, a tube with water where you just walk on water. And I filled uh, another sack with beads, solid beads, so you get the material of uh, solid material. So there I changed the, the pressure inside to make it not a positive pressure of blowing up a balloon, but extracting the air to make it a negative pressure 
So you use the atmospheric pressure, which is squeezing the structures tightly together to form a structural uh, unit. So how, how the body penetrates into the environment by into the atmosphere, and then walking on water developed into six different ways of walking on water. So you, <clears throat> you can fill a bag and just lie on it, it becomes the waterbed. And the waterbed was the first uh, sculpture that we toured America with Andy Warhol and Robert Morris and Les Levine. Um, <clears throat> taken from the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, where they had the uh, structure Gonflable exhibition, which was a, a joint exhibition of industrial air pneumatic devices with architectural pneumatic devices and artistic pneumatic devices. So it was organized by the Utopi group. So obviously Utopia comes into the idea of the imagination of the perfect future, perfect environment. <clears throat> so on, on that point of utopias, which I've always been very uncomfortable with, really, because the word itself has been um, appropriated by the left wing, political wing, um, <clears throat> to mean impractical. It's, it's unrealizable. And Sir Thomas More, when he wrote Utopia, he was just making a play on the words. The utopia in Greek means the best place, which is very practical. It's existing, and it's obviously realizable. But he changed the EU to just you, uh, which has a totally different meaning in Greek, which means not. So it's a not place. It's a no place. It doesn't exist. Uh, <clears throat> and he was writing this, this history of an island uh, for his friend Erasmus, you know, who is a key European intellectual. So you begin to get the idea of, like, what was he doing in the UK making a joke about Europe, uh, in a way. And <clears throat> so Utopia, I, I, this title uh, is on my um, uh, disc, is, is called um, Art modeling utopias. So this is trying to get over the, the, the meaning of the word utopia is something impractical because, in fact, utopias are the same as experiments, scientific experiments. They're modeling, just as we model the atmosphere to know how climate change is, is actually going to happen, is happening. We can model uh, futures. And architects do this all the time. Town planners do this all the time. This is one of the great things about coming to Singapore, is because you can see it's an island, and it's designed as utopia. You walk around the streets, and you can see where all these ideas have come from. And so they have actually been realized in Singapore, where they're not particularly realized in the UK. The best example is the use of water in uh, Singapore where you have a barrage, barrage, you enclose the lagoon to provide fresh water. And so, <clears throat> to jump ahead a bit from the beginnings of doing scientific experiments to creating architecture, they're creating artistic events, uh, <clears throat> then going through every different discipline, in uh, different scientific uh, field, uh, the interest comes, well, what does that mean for me as an artist? You know, what can I do with that? It's a, a fantastic level of freedom to create whatever you want to do. I mean, you could call that utopian, but I call it uh, designing the future. You know, it's much more practical uh, because it's real, and this structure in the desert it's not a utopian in the sense of it's unrealizable because it is realized on, in the film. And there's another fundamental difference with the practice of art uh, in the in traditional sense is very much based on imagining what is painted. The image is made for you to imagine something in the full knowledge that it's not real. This is separation between what is real and what is imagined. And this brings up the utopian idea that 
utopian is imagined, it's not real, therefore it's not real. But this is real, and a lot of people find it difficult, amazingly, to see, well, that, that can't be real. I mean, it's a film. Uh, so you have to be present with the sculpture to actually experience the, to have the experience. So going back to the first structure, where we built a structure which was made of um, black and red plastic. Uh, this created a, a, a mono, uh, chromatic space because <coughs> unlike a painting which reflects light for you to be able to see the image, it's a membrane that transmits the light and the of the wavelength, eliminating all the uh, surrounding wavelengths to the one uh, wavelength of the color. And when the eye perceives one color, one wavelength, it has a problem and it's constantly searching for the complementary color. And after you've been in a completely red space for several minutes, then the eye starts producing the complementary color, which is, uh, so you start seeing green clouds in the space. Well, this is a an experience you can only have by being in, immersed in the, in the structure. I was working with, a, a, later I was working with a, a scientist, uh, Richard Gregory, who'd done enormous number of experiments on the eye, and he could create uh, visual illusions, specifically by using tricks on the eye. Uh, but this is not to, to trick the eye, it's just to produce the image on the, on the, on the retina. So it's the way the science is involved in the art, producing the art, which it, in a sense has always been done by the artist choosing colors that were being developed by scientists. So as new colors are developed, so artists are always some of the first to use the new colors. So this is a new way of producing a particular color by using the retina itself. Um, <clears throat> so to get back to the, um, the cloud, uh, the first thing I did was to make everything inflatable. So I'd made inflatable tables, inflatable chairs, uh, inflatable cupboards, um, and then uh, developed these ideas of walking into the environment, walking on earth, air, fire, and water, reducing the whole environment into four elements, which is the, the Greek idea of, of what the nature, of what the environment consists of. Uh, but I would always have to use uh, a fan, a mechanical fan, which always used electricity, used energy, and plastics used plastics, which were then becoming uh, known as a pollutant of the environment. So <clears throat> the idea was to design something which was completely independent of any fossil energy. And so this structure works uh, completely without uh, fossil energy. There's no moving parts, there's no fans, uh, <clears throat> but it's not magic, it's real. And it w operates in the desert, and you, you can see the film of how it works. By um, The best way to remember the, the technicality is that it works on absorption, reflection, and transmission, A-R-T, which spells art. So it's really the optics, optical properties of the environment. And it works exactly similar to a cloud. It, the, the sunlight comes through, transmits through the transparent. It gets reflected off the silver membrane and absorbed into the black. The light is absorbed and then it's re-emitted re as heat. So the heat expands the structure and then the, the heating continues, so you prov provide uh, buoyancy for the cloud to be lifted off the desert and flying around. And once you have the, a, a membrane which is radiant selective, you can lower the dew point, the, the temperature of the membrane to the dew point of any locality. 
and this is as it says in the film, by controlling absorption, reflection, transmission, you can lower the dew point, you can lower the temperature value of, of any environment, any space, anywhere on the planet. You can lower it to the freezing point of water, or you can r raise it to the boiling point of water. Um, <clears throat> so that, that is passive control of the environment. There's no mechanical operation required. And this has enormous significance to global warming. And so you could say this is the first movie on global warming, because it shows how we have to transition from fossil energy into uh, renewable, air-based, atmospheric, solar energy. And it's really satisfying to have one of the works uh, by Thomas uh, Saracino, who's taken this idea, and one of the, the sub-ideas in the film is it shows that you can, once you have a, a cloud, it, you can float it up into the atmosphere and it's taken by the jet stream and you just float around the, the, the planet. And so he's worked with NASA and uh, shown exactly what uh, path you take from any location to any other location. So that's again an in integration of uh, the science and the art translating the science into an art form that can be participated by the public. And this is the, uh, the interest now is, is to invent forms of air structures that can translate science into uh, solutions to global warming. Now, if you look at the film, you can see about 30, 40 ideas for solving global warming. And the idea is, well, how do you communicate this to government? How do you allow the population, the whole population of the planet to participate in saving the planet? Because it's impossible for industry alone to go through the industrial cycle to search for an invention that's a silver bullet, as they call, to make an industry and then turn it into the industry and pr produce the solution to global warming, that's simply not going to happen. It's impossible with nuclear energy or any other source except these participatory environmental atmospheric uh, inventions, interventions that can be done by anybody. And. Uh, We've just done one in, in the Marshall Islands, for instance, by um, <clears throat> using information only. Uh, so I divide my work up into the um, <clears throat> material phase, which is all the pneumatics, a bouncy castle, waterbed, walking on water, earth, air, fire, and water. So all the material of the atmosphere is how to control. But then second is the energy, which is this energy structure uh, so the way that fits historically into the development of structures, architectural structures, is that um, but I worked with Mark Mr. Fuller in the 60s, and <clears throat> he reduced uh, structure to simple compressive struts. So you just triangulate compression, and you can span any span to far greater spans than a beam. The beam always has the moment, so it's limited in distance. There's, there's a point where the beam gets so big it itself collapses. Whereas <clears throat> Fray Otto, who I also worked with in the 70s, um, reduced everything to tension. So it's pure tension, and he developed tension structures. Um, <clears throat> so this is the first energy structure. I call it energy structure. It works purely on energy and the energy in the air. So when you inflate a, a balloon, you're in pushing air energy into the balloon. And <clears throat> the air structure is different from static structures. It's, to, it's a dynamic structure. So it's independent of moment. And this is the reason you can span unlimited space by a pneumatic structure, because it has no moment. It is supported at every point of the membrane. 
uh, <coughs> uh, we did some work in, in the 70s to make very, very large domes. Um, <coughs> and Frey Otto and um, um, Overarup. Is that five or ten? <laughs> Always wrap up. <laughs> to use this infinite span of the air structure. <clears throat> so with this, you can get infinite span, but you can also get infinite span without support connecting to the ground. So it's simply a cloud structure that floats over. And this is what I've been doing ever since, is communicating this change in structure and science to be able to control the environment, you know, to, to solve global warming. And that's enough for today. <laughs> so I'd like to actually start by picking up um, something that uh, um, you were just starting to touch on, uh, Graham, in your, um, in your, in your, in your talk. Um, and that's this very, very particular moment in the 1960s uh, where I think it's fair to say there was an explosion of creativity um, with regards to inflatable objects and inflatable structures. We had groups like Ant Farm coming into formation in, uh, in the States, UFO in, um, in Italy, the Utopia Group, of course, that you were you know, kind of connected with in France. Um, as well as, you know, kind of artists like yourself, event structure research um, kind of group. Um, suddenly, inflatables became, you know, kind of a, a source of inspiration for architects and artists. So you were very much part of that moment and that movement. Um, so what was it about inflatables at that time that created such excitement in the 1960s? There's a, a curator called... Um Mark de Source, who's written, a, 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 had a very good exhibition, traveling exhibition, on the inflatable moment. And he was trying to say that uh, the May 68 revolution in Paris started from the air art um, uh, structure gonflable exhibition in the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, when they sacked the curator of the film department, all the students were so angry, they started protesting in the street. And they simply never stopped. Um, so I, I find it difficult to, to think it happened that way exactly, but I think from the air structure point of view, um, there has always been interest in, as your work has shown, which is fantastic historical research, you know, um, air structures have always been uh, popular. I think where I came in is to make this connection with the body. Mm. So it's an interactive, it's a tactile, it, it's an amplification of the senses, the human senses. If you look at all those early structures there, although they're dynamic by nature of being an air structure, they're, they're trying to be static. Mm. They're just rigid structures that don't do anything. And so uh, connecting it with the body is the point of extending the body in time I mean, it becomes a reality, part of reality. It's not a separation of reality that you have to then wait or go and do something else to, to get into. You are immersed in the work yourself. It depends on what you do. And I think this is what uh, triggered the participation movement in the 60s. And uh, I went to a very interesting conference on the, the uh, Royal Society. They had a conference on cultural evolution. And they showed that uh, copying, in fact, not uh, far from being an undesirable thing, it's something that we as a species rely on. You know, we copy our parents. We copy the people we admire or who we're fans of. So this copying is ex essential to participation. So you, you want to make some, and, and, and there's a, a disconnect slightly with the art career of making the, the work of the individual genius and making something that is going to be used by everyone. And the waterbed and uh, bouncy castle was uh, 
invented with the idea that you could make it yourself uh, is very, very easy to copy. You make it the most easy thing to copy. Now, when I took patents, for instance, which is a traditional way of protecting ideas, uh, they didn't really have much effect. You know, people were just copying them anyway. <laughs> so, uh, which is a good thing rather than a bad thing. And I think this is why participation is the point of takeoff, where pneumatics changed into you know, a really uh, instrument of communication, of the real communication as opposed to the electronic environment, where we're separated from reality. When we look at a screen, uh, there's a, a mediator. Mm. And the whole point about being present in the artwork is it enables people to participate in their own environment, the creation of their own, it, because they own it. Mm. This work in uh, the Marshall Islands, we, I didn't even, they knew nothing, they don't even know who I am, right? but I got the information to them, knowing they would copy. Mm. And, so, it, and, and they, they went through this experimental stage. They understood how to produce water, you know, from seawater. And they made their own, they designed their own. And then they're now on 35 houses in the Marshall Islands uh, producing water. So it's that uh, stimulation of taking control of the environment. Which, so in addition to this notion of copying and participation, which uh, in that kind of creative moment in the in the 1960s, I guess the other um, uh, sort of technological kind of innovation which enabled a lot of the early inflatable architects and artists to work was synthetic materials, um, and specifically kind of the uh, the development um, of plastic. Um, so, Arthur and and uh, any of the curators who want to come in on this, I wonder if you can talk about. Um, the emergence of these new synthetic materials and why they were so important and what that enabled. Um, yeah, so um, through, through research on uh, inflatable objects, um, I uh, came to understand that synthetic materials is actually a very new given thing. Um, and you can see this very well in the exhibition if you look at uh, what materials these inflatable objects are made. So 18th century, you had hot air balloons. The Montgolfier brothers, they were paper manufacturers. It's really not coincidence that they were paper manufacturers. Even the first hot air balloon in China, 200 years before Christ, the small ones, it came because China is the inventor of paper. Um, so materials enable different technological possibilities, and with this, they spark the imagination. Um, so in the 1930s, I showed we had these big floating figures for the mass parades in Russia and the United States. This was at the time uh, cotton impregnated with rubber. Rubber was the material used. Basically, uh, it was a material that was used very strongly because of the rise of the car industry. So the pneumatic tire um, uh, needed rubber. So the, the floating figures are basically a side product of this. Then, uh, then for the Second World War, U.S. needed extra rubber supplies. There was really um, not, not much rubber, uh, and uh, also the, the supplies from Southeast Asia were cut off. So they have put all the tire manufacturers together that they needed to produce synthetic rubber to somehow deal with this uh, shortage. And this, uh, all this produced basically synthetic materials as we know it now. So the Second World War was kind of a catalyst for uh, the invention and creation of synthetic materials. And um, as rubber is a scarce material, suddenly plastics, synthetics uh, could be produced en masse and in my understanding, this was, must have been also a big influencer of um, the nomadic movement, as um, uh, Marc de Sos uh, talks about. Uh, this is this uh, curator uh, in the 70s. And uh, 
so we had plastic at the one hand that was a big influencer and then we had acid lsd at the other hand mm -hmm. these two together mm -hmm. created something imaginative mm. but uh, so i would be also really interested to hear from you you uh, graham how you experienced this when you were at the structure gonflable exhibition in paris because when I talked to Ant Farm, the American group, they said, wow, we made it these inflatable environments and then we were tripping and then we were understanding houses are living organisms and et cetera. So yeah, I'm, it's very interesting to think about how the materials really influence our understanding of the world, our thinking and our ideas of the world. So I'm just going to um, oh. just hold for a second and ask if we've got questions from the audience at this stage. We do have a roving mic, so yep, okay, we've got one question over here, and then we'll come back to that moment. Hi. Um, I was wondering whether um, with inflatable art um, being um, up in the sky, nowadays you have this uh, new drone tag where you have all the mini drones being lit up and it also floats in the sky. Do you think that um, it's a new way of expressing, you know, um, art using kind of like air as well? Thanks. Anna, I think you're well placed to take <laughs> yeah. that one. Um, well, I mean, we are very interested in the exhibition and I, especially within my practice, in this kind of um, development of the vertical perspective. And we see hot air balloons as the first moment that people could come off the ground and have this gaze from above on the earth. And um, I mean, drones are, I mean, there's a big, big uh, science of aeronautics in general. So we have aeroplanes, we have rockets, we have drones now. Uh, and of course, I mean, it's uh, the, the view from above used to be uh, purely for birds and the gods. You know, this is a kind of, it used to be a very special view that we as humans couldn't have. And with the hot air balloon, there was a kind of empowerment of this view from above. And we as humans could have that view as well. And of course, with technology developing and drones developing. I mean, you can argue if this is a good or a bad development, but um, this view from above uh, becomes much more common. And what I'm interested in is uh, seeing this more in, like, I mean, satellites have given us, we, we use Google Maps every day. So in that way, uh, I don't think drones are really giving us a completely new perspective. Uh, and also, I think, uh, sort of lifting up into the air. Um, it's, it's a new unmanned version of it, but of course you could connect it to sort of unmanned balloons that go up, just using a different technique. So I want to um, kind of end up by coming back to this thread of uh, sustainability, which um, kind of, I think, cuts, cuts through Graham's practice very, very clearly, and, and you end up by talking about some of the work that you're doing now, which is, you know, kind of putting a lot of this, this, this theory into practice. Um, uh, obviously, you know, kind of when we talk about the main material of, of, uh, of inflatables, which is usually plastic, um, that has a very different kind of meaning um, in today's uh, kind of climate crisis uh, context. Um, and so I want to, you know, kind of perhaps ask Fabiola to, to reflect a little bit on um, why an artist, um, you know, like Thomas Saraceno, who's in the exhibition with Musée Era Salah, um, has chosen to, um, I guess, kind of pivot his practice um, into a space where he's using plastics um, to raise awareness about environmental issues. Yeah, I think what, what you could see in the exhibition quite nicely is how plastic initially kind of united us or gave us like all these possibility and then slowly or gradually divides us again. So I think that's like something that you can see now very clearly how the world is also divided by plastic and we are like far from finding some solutions. And I think also what Thomas Saraceno is picking up on that um, is basically how it can unite us again in a sort of um, 
commodity way, so the, the, the recycling of something that is so um, amb an ambivalent product of our Anthropocene, actually, uh, how that can again uh, connect us and in a, in a sort of visionary way. Um, and I think that's, that's very much what is underneath uh, in his artwork or in his practice. And, and many of the practices, I think, of the artists in the show. Um, we've, we're out of time. Uh, it's been amazing to have such a kind of thoughtful set of reflections on how inflatables have, uh, have inspired both imagination and practical uh, kind of practice as well. We're going to take a short break now. We'll invite you to come outside, um, join us for a cup of coffee, a cup of tea. Um, and then we're going to call you all back in, um, where we're going to have uh, an afternoon session which features presentations from uh, two local artists, um, kind of Dawn Ong, who's in the exhibition, and Prisma, who are part of our Art Science Late program. And Arta is going to come back and talk to us about one of the really key uh, kind of outdoor participatory interventions um, which we've organised for uh, Floating Utopias. This is a piece called Signal. Thank